One of the fastest growing research universities in the country is USF, and one of its strengths is the way it's combining research with an international agenda. In fact, it's helping USF become even more competitive on the global stage. Joining us for this uh, spotlight interview on, on leaders in the Tampa Bay community, Karen Holbrook, Dr. Holbrook, Senior Vice President for Global Affairs and International Research at the University of South Florida. Welcome. Thank you. And welcome to Tampa Bay. You were president of Ohio State University was, for five, five years. years I yeah. know, but still, it's relatively new in this area, and that was a big responsibility. It was a definitely a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was the largest university in the nation in terms of student population, but USF is becoming one of the largest universities as well. We're well, ninth largest in the nation. It is indeed. Yeah. And what was the attraction to come to USF for you? Well, actually, I retired. I left Ohio State to retire down here with my husband, really? who had been following me around the country for a long time. He came down here, and Dr. Genshaf called and said, would you come and fix research? And I said, well, I'll come for six months fix research and then make somebody else come in as a hero. And that was five years ago, so huh. I haven't quite left. Okay, so how did you fix it? Well, we <laughs> had to revise the budget a little bit to get that back in line and um, then just started some activities and kept the research enterprise going, which is now built to about a $400 million mm -hmm, mm -hmm. research enterprise, which ranks us number 50 in the nation, which is very impressive when you think of many of the very large research universities that have over a billion dollars, like the University of Washington and uh, some of those universities. So we're very proud of what we've accomplished in research here. Absolutely. And it's our faculty who do it. Dr. Holbrook, tell me about USF World. USF World is really the centerpiece for globalizing the University of South Florida. We call ourselves a globally engaged, locally committed research university, which means we really believe that every one of our students should leave the University of South Florida prepared to be a global citizen, to be prepared to be a global leader, to be prepared to be a global steward. So all of our activities, whether they're in the academic domain, whether they're in the research domain, whether in some of the administrative domains like the library, like our office of development, like athletics, everyone should be thinking globally, everybody should be connecting globally, because it's simply the way the world is working today. So that's the responsibility of our office. and. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a very. So, um, I, I, I read an interview with you where you said it is through our strengths in research that we sell our university to partners abroad. It is through our faculty connections that we forge our strongest relationships. And it's through our research credibility and output that we attract international students. So is the goal to put faculty in other countries? Is it to attract international students? Is it to form alliances with other countries? What is under the umbrella of becoming more global as a it's university? Actually, it's all of those things that you think of. If you start in the academic domain, we have over 200 agreements with universities abroad, and sometimes they're agreements that are to do academic programs where we will have study abroad or education abroad. Sometimes they're in the research domain where faculty are doing research. So our faculty really are very connected globally because if you think about research, you realize that the problems that people are working on aren't our problems here in the United States, but they're global problems. They're clean and alternative energy, they're health care, they're education, they're poverty, they're all of the different problems, sustainability, the environment, climate change, all of these things, they don't affect the United States, they affect the world. And so to find solutions to those, you really need to reach out for your international partners. And that's what we do in research, but it's also what we do in education to connect. So it's, um, it's a very exciting place to be. You know, you have such an interesting combination. We talk about uh, you know, the globalization of, of this university, but your, your, research, your background is research. Uh, biomedical sciences? I, I am. I was a researcher. I was an NIH researcher for 25 years at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and I worked on human fetal skin development and genetic disease. So I huh. spent a large, background, large part of my background in basic science research. It, it's a good grounding. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to right. take off from when you're doing other kinds of things. So, Now, do I understand there's also a collaboration with McDill Air Force Base? We have a wonderful collaboration with McDill Air Force Base. We actually have a new office of military partnerships that is run by General Marty Steele. Mm -hmm. It's a three-star. Just talked to him no, yesterday. Did we sure did. Excellent. Well, the idea is that McDill has so many things that connect us through our engineering 
through our number of our different programs. And um, Marty is very able to get into MacDill very easily and make these relationships. Um, we work with special operations. We work with central operations. And um, you know there's the Coalition Village yes, at MacDill. Yes, a lot of people don't realize how many countries. I think there's 67. A big, big global community huge, on MacDill from huge, all over the world. Huge. That's just so, fascinating. Uh, this is a wonderful partnership for the city of Tampa, and we're so pleased that they're there. And we're pleased that they're willing to work with the University of South Florida. So you've so, been here five years? Five years. What, what are your thoughts about living in Tampa Bay? Oh, I love the area. Love the area. My home is in Longboat Key. But I also have a home up here in Tampa Bay, so I spend my weeks in Tampa Bay and get to go home to Longboat in the weekend. I can't think of a nicer place in the country to live than here. Well, it, the weather is certainly different than Ohio was. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> and we keep hearing from our Midwest friends now that they come to Florida to cool off because it's been so hot here <laughs> all summer. So, yes, definitely when February comes, I'm pleased to be here. It's so interesting that you came out of retirement to do this, and now you are fully engaged in this global effort at USF. Fully engaged. It's true. I just came back from Saudi Arabia on Monday night where I've been working for there? the last. Well, I work with a university called King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. I helped start it seven years ago and have stayed on with the International Advisory Council and I'm working to develop a life sciences program with them. So I, it's fun to go back and forth. It's very interesting. It's a very different environment. Wow. Interesting place. Dr. Holbrook, it's been a pleasure talking to you, you. And good luck with your uh, global efforts on USF's part. You know, it's just such, um, it's just an outstanding university. Really something we're that we're proud, proud of, of in this you. area. And glad to have you Thank here you. as well. Thank you very much. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of international affairs, it's no secret the whole world is closely watching America's presidential race. Of course, the Republican National Convention has focused the spotlight on Tampa Bay and on Florida's crucial role in the election outcome. Our next guest br uh, brings his own unique perspective on the election, having served as a counselor to President George W. Bush, right by his side there. He also has played a key role in two presidential elections and knows well the importance of press and messaging strategy. Joining us, Don, uh, Don, Dan Bartlett, pardon me, President and CEO of Hill & Knowlton Strategies. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's good to have you here. So um, from your perspective, having worked on presidential campaigns, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little about the Republican National Convention coming to Tampa Bay. What are we going to get from this? This is uh, well, quite a little boot for Well, the first thing is refreshing to attend a convention without any responsibility. Yes. So it's, it's, it's been nice and fun to be here. And I, I must say, Tampa has done a wonderful job. I've, like I said, I was in New York for the 0, uh, 04 election, Minneapolis in 08, Philadelphia 2000, and uh, the city of Tampa Bay has done a phenomenal job as a host. And, and, and having been in the White House for seven years and understanding uh, the role of, of, of critical states and what the <laughs> yeah. states play, I, right. can't, I, I can't downplay as much or uh, uh, explain to your viewers how much Florida yeah. is involved in public policy discussions in Washington, in the White House, on Capitol Hill. I know it's a burden to be a swing state when you have all the political <laughs> ads hitting uh -huh. left and right, left and right, but the fact that Florida is so consequential to electing our president, um, it means that you have a front row seat uh, to public <laughs> policy and such, and so um, I, I think the, the, the opportunity for, for the community here to be on the national stage mm -hmm. is, is really fantastic. What do you think uh, Tampa Bay will, uh, will feel as an impact of the convention coming here? Well, when you have the, the influentials like you have from the, from the media on a national stage, uh, from thought opinion leaders, from, uh, from a public policy standpoint and others, when people have an opportunity to see firsthand that it's not just a swing state that we cover uh, as red or blue, but that there's a vibrant, active community here, business community, that, uh, that Florida really is also kind of uh, a great reflection of the, of, of, of the nation with regards to the dynamics of the northern part of the state and to the southern part of the state and all those things. And so um, the opportunity to showcase it like that, I think, gives. Mm -hmm. And the, the important thing for Tampa will be is let's not just make this a moment. Let's make this a right. lasting. Let's, right. let's build on this. And I think there's, there's great opportunity for that to happen. And like I said, um, even after the election is over, Florida still plays uh, a key role, like I said, in the governing of our nation. Um, when I was dealing with uh, big policy matters, whether it be immigration or education or security, um, we always thought about the impact of the big states of Florida, Texas, California, New York, 
um, it is central. And so I think um, going forward to think about is not only how do we leverage it during a political year, but how can we leverage that profile to make sure that the, the public policy matters mm -hmm. that are important to Tampa are prominent in the decision making in Washington because I know it's on the minds of the people right. who work in the White House. You know, the, the saying uh, down here is, uh, as goes Florida, go, so goes the nation. Absolutely. So w why Florida? Why is it such a critical state? Well, I think it, the demographics uh, changing here so much. Because you got the panhandle, you got Miami, you, you got this, you, you got, do. I mean. And uh, and I I got to know Florida a little bit better than I thought because there was that little recount that went on in 2000 when <laughs> really? we all thought the Hardly election. Hardly recall. Was, uh, I know, I try to uh, block that out myself. Wow. Um, you know, it's interesting though. I, I think both, both parties have uh, legitimate claims on thinking that they should own Florida. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's because You've of the different that. dynamic. Yeah, and so, <laughs> Um, it, it truly is a, a, a toss-up in that regard, whereas there's fewer and fewer states that really play that way. And so, and the fact that there's so many electoral votes on top of that, um, you know, there could be a smaller state that could be in play, but it's not enough to really make a difference in the overall electoral map. So, you know, there's no way Mitt Romney wins the presidency without winning Florida, in my opinion. So, you're going to be seeing a lot of them and a lot of time here, and, and, and that will be the same for President Obama. You know, uh, your years in the White House and, you know, your expertise now is obviously uh, strategy, uh, press, messaging. Dealt with um, a few crises. Yeah, just, just a <laughs> few. Um, do you think uh, the message has become more uh, divisive over the past few years? A lot of people are talking about the rancor between yeah. the two parties and the things they're slinging at each other. And I wish I've been out of Washington now. So I left uh, Washington in January of 08 after seven years in the White House, I wish I could say that my cynicism has <laughs> eroded. It has not. However. Um, my, my concern is I think the partisanship in Washington is systemic. Um, you're often, it, it's often described as, well, we just need a new leader uh, who can change the tone in Washington. I, I believe that my, uh, my former boss, President Bush, who had a strong track record in Texas of operating in a bipartisan mm -hmm. way, earnestly tried to do that. I think President Barack Obama came in office earnestly wanting to, to operate in a bipartisan way. The challenge is, is that, like I said, the systemic realities, and the, the key one really is this redistricting. We have so many congressional districts now that are no longer contested in general elections. There right. are 80-20 yes, districts on right. both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so when you have a member of Congress every day waking up more concerned about his or her primary and who's running to the right of yeah. them or to the left right. of them and right. not to the center, you can only appreciate what type of policy you're going to get from that. If, you're, if both parties are looking at their extreme flanks, that's why you don't get the type of compromise yeah. in the middle. And a classic example of that would be when we were trying very uh, desperately to push free trade packs. Columbia, for example, was one that we were pushing uh, very much. And, and you traditionally could rely upon about 70 Democrats in the House who would vote for tra free trade bills. They were called free trade Democrats problem was is that they would come to us and say privately, Mr. President, I'm for you on this, I'm with you, because economically, Columbia is a rounding error for our economy. But from a foreign policy standpoint, trying to help those in, uh, democracies in, in, in Latin America, when you got Hugo Chavez mm -hmm. and others down there uh, pushing back, critical that we send the important signal. What they would say, though, is that, Mr. President, if I vote for this, the labor unions will run somebody in my primary, mm -hmm. and I'll get beat yeah. in my primary. And so when the primary starts dictating um, uh, public policy. I think that's where some of the systemic partisanship uh, comes from. One other important point on the partisanship from my communications. This, you know, transformation of technology and what it's done mm -hmm. where we have iPads and we're right. able to consume. Right. You, you would think that would have a, a positive impact on our, on our debate. That people now have more access to information. They can enlighten the debate by, by learning more. Mm, I think what it's I the found contrary, has been contrary. The contrary. I think we've made it easier for people to be partisan. Right. We, we're going to places find their to own reinforce point our of views. View and reinforce our own views. And so well, that's, a, that's a real challenge yeah. I think we face. Well, I know you've done all the media this week, and we're pleased that you spent some time with us here on Front Row Tampa Bay, well, kind of rebranding our own message about Absolutely. what Tampa Bay has to offer. Dan, good to have you here. My pleasure. Have fun this week at the convention. Coming up next, some exciting developments in the city of Clearwater, and Frank will have that.